So uh, I was already publishing the Foundations of Decentralized Identity, and I partnered with Book.io, and now we have, we, we've minted the book. It's, it's happening, it's really happening, which is super exciting. And with, these, with this mint, we're funding more than half of that, those proceeds go into a scholarship. And um, yeah, maybe I've rambled too much. Well, well, no, I think no, it's great because the, the, the- I get passionate about this. Tony also had this vision that in order to get in the Prison Pioneer program, you had to have the NFT and it's like, yes. oh, hang on, Laura's like, I'm, I'm making a book. Yeah. I'm making an NFT of the book, you want to do what? Then we add in this scholarship dimension, it's okay, cool, how does that get dispersed? And we'll get the leaders in on that side, but also to whom? So there's another player who's not here, power learning program out of yes. Kenya or Nigeria? Kenya. Kenya. Is, they're running and they're basically giving about $400 USD worth of ADA when they complete the course. So they have to have, you get the NFT to get into the course. Well, they, hold on. Oh, <laughs> first. I'm learning. <laughs> Sorry, but no. First, um, student reader is working with Power Learn Project, um, Cripsense, Adanian Labs, and Emergo um, to identify students from these institutes. And student reader is working with them to identify them and give them student credentials. So once they have this student credential. Um, we will, we're going to airdrop them this NFT, this VNFT. They're going to have access to the course. And once they complete that course, they get a course completion credential from Atala. And that is how they are able to get the scholarship funding. And with this, the scholarship funding is um, they get a, a, you know, a substantial amount to further their career, to uh, further their education. Um, they can use this funding to take courses through PLP, through CripSense. Um, and we're hoping that once they have those scholarships and those funds, they, they come back into our ecosystem and start building you know, their own projects on our ecosystem. But there's a lot of technical stuff that happens behind the scenes that you know, these guys talk about. So maybe that's a good point to jump over, uh, Adam, to talk a little bit about some in bigger picture. What it is you folks do, and then we'll talk about how that was tied together. Yeah, absolutely. So when you know, the books, the NFTs are sold to the community, um, this, you know, it's a two-part thing, right? So the NFTs can be given to the students who are going to take the course, but we're also, they're also being minted and sold to people who are interested in taking the course themselves, people in Western countries who have the means to be able to pay for the course so they can learn this skill. And um, what has happened is Book.io has agreed to give the majority of the money that pays for these NFTs to a trust that will pay for the scholarships. Now, who's going to hold on to that money? That's always the question in crypto, right? If, you know, uh, people are always scared of having uh, crypto a lot of times because they say, well, what happens if I lose my keys, right? I have my ledger, what happens if that gets lost? What happens if I lose the paper that has my seed phrase written on the background? Well, what Summon has done is we have a platform where you can develop a multi-signature wallet. So you can have five people who all have to sign off on a transaction. So if one person were to lose their keys, there's still four people there who can pick up the slack. Or more importantly, you know that there's, um, it's gonna take a majority vote in this case, three out of five, to be able to spend money on the treasury. So when people buy the NFT books, the money for the, that money that is going to the scholarships goes into what we're calling our student reader digital trust. And it was actually the first community that we built on Summon, because Summon was launching just about the time that involved in this program. So it's really exciting that we can make this our first community on Summit. Uh, so the money goes into the Student Reader Digital Trust and we were able to identify uh, with Tony's help and Laura's help five people who would be trustees of uh, the trust. Uh, so Laura and I are trustees. Um, there's a, one of our partners in um, Africa is a trustee and then one of the students who's involved with the program is also a trustee. So these are people who are in the community who really care about the program. And just like you would have a, um, you know, if you're having any other kind of legal trust, you have people who are, you know, up, you know um, given the task and made the decisions. But the really cool thing is that there's no banker involved. Um, if you, in a regular trust, you know, the trustees decide they're going to spend the money, they tell the banker, cut the check and send it. In our case, with the platform that Riley and his team has built for us, um, the platform takes care of that part. 
Yeah, and uh, within Cardano, it's actually uh, relatively simple from the development standpoint to uh, sort of create this product because in Cardano, uh, multi-sigs are supported, uh, supported natively by the ledger. There's no need to write additional smart contracts. Um, and a lot of blockchains are doing this uh, in sort of the newer generation of uh, ecosystems. So uh, another example is Algorand, which uh, I know there's interest to uh, sort of look towards as uh, another ecosystem that is potentially viable for uh, adoption. And uh, within Algorand, similarly, they have uh, full native support for multi-sigs so that there's no need to write additional smart contracts. There's no need for uh, audits and you have the uh, security model built directly into the chain. So, But they still need some coordination help, right? Correct, yeah. So one of the primary benefits of the, the Summon platform for the purposes of using like a Cardano multi-sig would be uh, that we do coordinate all of the transaction signing uh, in a way where uh, users don't have to sort of copy and paste uh, their signatures around. Uh, the first uh, multi-sig dApp that came out in Cardano which was actually uh, from ADAO, uh, the, the DAO that we helped start, and there was others involved as well. I can't say that we're the only ones that uh, helped to start that by any means. But um, the uh, multi-sig that was put out by ADAO is not uh, sort of nearly as user-friendly as Summon. Um, and additionally, we're looking to incorporate uh, a number of different uh, ecosystems into Summon. Uh, and we also have product offerings outside of multi-sigs to, to offer. So this is just sort of uh, where we ended up being viable for this particular use case. I know that uh, one, of, one of my roles in the past was I was a sovereign foundation trustee. And I remember when we had signing events, there would be begging over a period of, if, if it was, God forbid, on a Friday, you had to beg and it was a long weekend to find people because you had to go and find a computer, sit down, get the CLI going. I'm a recovering software developer. I found it clunky and hard and I was afraid to screw it up. About half of the trustees involved were absolutely, utterly non-technical, which meant, yes, we had 12 trustees, but really there were three people who controlled the whole thing because a good half of them couldn't even load the CLI. So it's good to see that there was, and it was also very, very easy to do other than I did do the first authorization by accident, but you fixed that <laughs> user interface problem. Once you get a you know, better user interface, I'll find you a better user to break, so that's what my job is. Yeah, we also have uh, Matt who's on our team and I'm sure he's somewhere in this room or maybe uh, in the back somewhere, but he, uh, he breaks the product more than anybody, which is great because we need him to do that early so that users don't do it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really helpful to have feedback, you know. Um, yeah. One of the other parts of this project where we got brought in was to help on the governance framework. One of the things that we learn in, uh, as a, again, recovering software developer, I used to think technology was 90, 95% of the solution. I am completely upside down on that now. It's somewhere between five and 10%, depending on what you're doing. It might be a little higher, but if you haven't figured out the governance, you know, what's in it for me to join, what's in it for you to join, why would Snap really want to be involved as a multi-chain wallet? Well, there have to be reasons and there have to be incentives for them. One of the things we spent a lot of time on was the governance, and we created a nice, simple, what Tony call, coined the phrase, minimum viable ecosystem. It's actually, I've stolen the phrase. It's one of the things we do at Continuum Loop, is these minimum viable ecosystems. What we built in was really only a few players. We had to make sure we managed who is taking liability. It was not really a huge liability here. Are you really a student? So who is the actual issuer of a student credential? Because that really is the gate. But the question that came to my mind is, OK, great, I've got the NFT. Taken the course, I got my course completion verifiable credential, that's a prison play. I got this contract that will move money, but how does that all get decided that I'm really the student? So, and it, it gets a little bit complicated. Uh, there's a lot of math involved, but um, using elliptic curves and doing uh, arithmetic on points on uh, elliptic curves and doing these like, uh, elliptic curve point pairings and, and a bunch of other stuff that really is probably going to bore anybody listening to death. Um, by using this, uh, we can actually create proofs that do not expose anything outside of what it is that we're trying to prove. And these are known as zero knowledge proofs. And so um, 
what we can do is we can create a zero knowledge proof of what it is that we are trying to uh, verify, which is that this person is actually a student and that they have actually completed the course. They have this verified credential. Uh, and so by submitting that proof on chain, then it can interact with a smart contract which can release the funds uh, from the, the smart contract for that particular. And is, is there an oracle? There's an oracle involved in this, this because part of it's off chain, right? Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, in the current uh, partnership, there's uh, an oracle involved with the, the Cardano side of things, and that's Charlie 3. Um, yep. And Charlie 3 is providing not um, sort of their traditional data feed uh, for this, but actually what they call a on-demand oracle. And so uh, upon the requirement of that data being used on chain, w when it's needed, then they post the data and right. it can be used. Um, but it's, uh, it's a little bit different than the, the traditional yep. uh, sort of use case for an oracle, yeah. Yeah, in, in crypto, we you know, hear oracles, hey, what's the price of USD to BTC? What's the price of USDT to USDC? If anyone's really, really playing the fine, fine numbers. And that's a standard kind of oracle. This is kind of a smarter oracle saying, saying a couple things. One is, do you meet all the requirements? Importantly, do you meet all the requirements so that I don't have to steal your, all your identity information? I need to know you are a unique individual. You have the credential that says you took the course. You've got an identity from a valid issuer of the student ID, we will pay you. And I believe it's still there. I think it's there. I mean, it may be under development that says, and we're only going to pay you once. Because otherwise, I would just, poof, I wouldn't do that. I mean, no one would, no. Well, and additionally, what's really important is that in this system, there's no way for the Oracle provider, whether it's Charlie 3 or someone else, to say, oh, this person ought to be able to be uh, provided funds for the scholarship even if they aren't supposed to be, uh, there's no way for Charlie 3 to sort of fake that, right? Yeah. Um, the only sort of, uh, the only sort of access that they're given is that they do have temporary access to see that credential in full, yeah. not just the zero knowledge proof, but that's not, it's not <clears throat> a security concern, right? It's not a security problem, it's also a governance problem. It says, hey, you are going to have access to the student ID. You have an obligation to protect that and only use it when you need it and then dispose of it. You may look at it later, get the same student ID, and look, hey, hey, I've already seen it, but you don't actually have the student ID, especially with the zero knowledge proofs and hashing and stuff. So Laura, you, you've gone through this project. When do you think funds are actually gonna flow to the students? It sounds like it's relatively soon. Yes, so um, our cohort will be identified in early June. Um, that's when the PLP projects um, and CrypSense and Edenian Labs start their, or they have their graduating students. So they're identifying students that have gone through some kind of program already that they know are really interested in Web3 technology and have some kind of background in it um, in order to, to get them through that yep. you know, final lap there. And the cool thing is, is the Cardano community is quite active in Africa. We have both IO, we have the Cardano Foundation and Emergo are all very active in trying to encourage and one of the business problems they have is talent. And that's where you end up matching this learner to, so the learner can actually earn because businesses need this skill set. And that's what the course is helping with. One of the things I, I, I wonder about on this is where do you go next? Are you looking to grow student reader to be, this is the example number one. I know there's two more levels of PRISM, but what about Econ 101 at a university? Absolutely. Um, I was just speaking to someone here at this event, um, trying to get connected, because I would love, I mean, I'd love to, to start any course reader and start funding scholarships, but I really want to identify some women in this space and start finding projects that we can, you know, build a course reader and, and bring, you know, women into the space. And so, but, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm open to any project. <laughs> um, I, I, I just want to, you know, help with scholarships. I know how hard and difficult it is to find time and money to help, you know, further your education and, and, and um, so yeah, I just, I, I'd really, any project. <laughs> yeah, and it also, one of the things that Tony, Tony and I learned when, when Tony was building the course reader is, hey, you just assemble a bunch of material and then you apparently break copyright laws and all that type of stuff, which like, oh, there's a process here, <laughs> which is what Laura process, knew about. Yes. This is how the whole, you know, how do you actually do a course reader versus and how does the tech actually fit? It was a really neat way to see that, that kind of merge. Which kind of jumping topics a little bit, if you guys don't mind, I wanted to bring Adrian into this. Um, I was telling Adrian, I just read a, a, 
disturbing and interesting book, especially for those within the decentralization community. It's by Cory Doctorow and another author. It's called uh, Choke Point Capitalism. The, the, the message behind it is, I'll give you the, the, the has anyone read a Kindle? It opens up and says the publisher has asked to publish this without digital rights management. I always wondered why they would do that. Why would they remove the lock on the book? It makes no sense. Like, I, I can now copy this book. It turns out that's the hook that allows authors, that causes authors to be caught in the system. And their, their dollars they see start dropping and dropping and dropping. And if you try to hack the crypto, which is easy to do, there's code available. Remember we hacked DVDs a while back. You have immediately, they press a button and you are now under either criminal or federal charges under DMCA in the US and comparable law. Canada. It's actually the weapon of Amazon, of Audible, same company, Kindle, same company, Spotify does this for music. But it brings out, he brings out a whole bunch of ideas. How do we fix this? How do we get the money back into the hands of the authors, the recording artists, the, the lyric writers, all of these artists out there who are being basically absolutely, utterly screwed by the system. And I found out about, I heard about the, just, just, just here, about Adrian's efforts. Maybe get a little history, because we're going to talk about a book that likely is coming out. These teams are working together, but you didn't come from the book no, world. No, um, I'm a sound engineer, music producer. I've been doing it for over two decades in the sense of producing music for known artists, recording them, uh, coming with, with the whole concept from beginning to end of the, of the process of recording, mixing, and then letting them put it out. So in that process, there's a lot of individuals that get uh, left out or someone takes their credit and uses it as their own. So within that, I was very heartfelt because of the fact is that that happened to me. And time and time again, I saw it happen to friends of mine. So we came with this idea that it shouldn't only happen Check, check, check. It shouldn't only happen in our industry, it should happen across any industry. So with, with that being said, we, we figured out a way that um, if there's a story that's been told, but either a book, an article, a blog, that whoever's been mentioned in that article has the right to be able to talk in that article. And if you're mentioned, you have a voice. And whoever has that voice has access to state that voice in that article. Not in your comment section, in your blog site, or your social media, but right then and there. So everybody can read it. So you can actually see that. So I could, you could be reading a story about some, an athlete, and the journalist is writing it, and the athlete might actually jump into the story and say, no, no, no that's not what I said. Exactly. And or, I did say that, but here's a bit of context because you're, you're getting a little sound bite from a story and they can come back in and again, there's this really weird hyperlinking, yeah. except there's actual quality behind it, which when you, Tony Rose is a good, as a name, it's actually quite a few of you. There's a lot. I know there's one other Daryl O'Donnell in Alberta, but he's in the federal penitentiary. It affected my security <laughs> clearance. <laughs> it wasn't me. But you end up with someone like Tony Rose or John Smith, you have a lot of names there. That, how do I know it's that one? So how are, you, how are you handling that kind of a problem? Well, once you, once you realize that you have your, just like anything else, you have to sign in with your phone number, your, your social media handles, and then your email. So if those, all of these things are then processed, you know who the individual is. Then coming in and talking to, to these guys, they have this, and you, you guys have this great uh, new system that you can actually identify who that person is yep. and, and, and execute to a different level. Yeah, and when, when he was describing to us what he wants to do, uh, when he was describing to us what he wants to do, he was basically, you know, we were saying to him, what you need is a form of, you know, verifiable credentials. You need to have this person be able to go and establish their identity. So let's start with like saying, okay, we're going to decide on an identity provider who 
you can say, I'm going to sign up with this website maybe and provide them with my ID so I can give them my name, my email address, my phone number, whatever I need to, to show them that I am the person who Adrian says I am uh, for when I want to make my contributions. And that way, when I want to go and contribute to the story where my name is tagged, the system knows that's Adam Rush. That is the correct person who's actually tagged here. The system doesn't have to see all that information about me. All the system has to do is check my wallet. And my wallet will give it a yes, no. Is this the proper person who's associated with this tag? Yes or no? And it'll be yes. Okay, you are now allowed to contribute to the story and write your side story here to write your entire book alongside your Adrian's book to fill out your biography so they're connected the way Wikipedia is connected, right? Um, and then well, where does it go from there? Well, then what about the fact that people are going to maybe be contributing money? Maybe there's going to be like a Patreon style way of contributing to this or a subscription model that people will want to be able to have access to these stories. How are we going to divide that up? Well, you're going to divide that up by going and claiming your share of the money. Again, you need to have maybe you, in this case, you go and you say, I'm going to have my, um, my Cardano wallet and I'm going to claim my money to my Cardano wallet. So I'm going to have that as part of my identity. So now when I go to claim it, I just tell the claim site, here's my wallet. Is that your wallet? Yes or no? Yes, I can identify that. But I don't have to give it all of my information. I don't have to show the payment system my ID over and over again. The payment system doesn't have to keep a copy of my driver's license so that when a hacker has a, you know, breaches it and has a data breach, we now have a thousand people have their identity stolen. And additionally, I, I just wanted to add, and I, I think that it's a really good point in time for me to add this, that the reusability doesn't just extend to one platform, but as long as there are uh, sufficient standards set, you can have, uh, whether it's KYC or some other sort of identification process, uh, carried out once and then reused across a number of different applications and use cases uh, without having to re-verify for, for those different use cases, yeah. Yeah, and you don't even have to use your real identity for everything. You could have a pseudonym where you've been your DJ Squirkle. You've been uh, building up your identity through this pseudonym, and you, ju you, you don't care about you know, claiming money. You don't care about giving people your address. You just want to be recognized for your work. So that's another way that people can build reputation without having to reveal things they don't want to reveal. Awesome. Yeah. So one of the other kind of linkages I look at here is there are protocols that, that Tony learned when building the non-copyright ready course reader, which was then corrected to be following the copyright approaches, which I think is more of a blanket. Hey, if you're using this as a fair use statement, if, you're, if it's bigger than this, 0.07% goes to that particular pool. That gets really hard to track. And you have these official, you know, the public, public publishers become the point of control because they're the ones who are getting that money which again, choke point capitalism, I should, I should rep this guy. <laughs> it's a terrifying but really cool book. The publishers are the ones who are in charge and the authors are seeing absolutely almost nothing. Only the top like 0.1% of authors actually make any money on this type of system. But you can actually see the replacing that with something similar. So I have a course reader where the actual professor gets their portion and maybe the school that they're representing at that point when they wrote the article as opposed to the publisher taking it all and then, oh, you never hit the threshold, so we didn't bother paying it, type of thing. So it kind of plays on to itself. Yeah. Where do you see this going in the music industry? Um, it's, it's, similar, it's similar in the music industry. Is when you give a person their credits, they, their, their, um, their royalties, their performances, their mechanicals, depending on what part in the music industry or, or what they contribute to that song, uh, for writers, either side, either composers or actual lyrical writers, uh, the splits usually are 50-50 if there's only two. But once you start addressing more writers to that one uh, song, then it starts getting convoluted. It gets yeah. mixed up because some people are either taking credit, either there's an A&R or a manager that's taking that credit when it's not really the right. I saw, I saw a, a thing of, uh, I think it was Bob Dylan, a song, songwriter, Bob Dylan, performer, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan, and there was an equivalent of Beyonce with like 87 people, and he had five times as, 
Is that bad that's, juju? That's facts. Get out of here. <laughs> no, you're just talking facts. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. I'm gonna do that to you. <laughs> um, but it was interesting seeing how many people, and it wasn't one or two. So you, you know, splits with 50-50, great. Well, there's 87, and I guarantee you it wasn't exactly 187th each. And then who were they repping? Who's actually in front of them? So the actual complexity gets to the point that, and the point that choke point capitalism, I should, it's like the, my theme today. They're saying it's impossible for a small artist, an author, to break in because they cannot get past the barrier of, here's all the paperwork you need to do to publish that thing. Just give it to the publisher then. Which means they don't see the money at the end of the day. Which is not fair. Absolutely, uh, totally unfair. Exactly. What else would you add, Laura? I'm excited for your project because you know, we're going to see kids, kids could be older people, I suppose, in, in, in Kenya soon, yeah. receiving this. Emergo is active on the ground. IO is active on the ground. We had some real five projects in, Niger in Kenya. Um, some work in Ethiopia, but soon they're going to be flowing. Yes, yes. So I can, I, I feel really confident talking about the minting because it's happening. Um, once June comes along and we actually hand out these scholarships, I'll be, you know, talking more about that part because I'm, I, like I said, I'm not very technical and I'm, I, I just want to see it. Like once I see it, I know it's happening and I can, I can, I can really freely speak about it. Um, but tonight, if you see me, Tony, or even Daryl... I was um, going to jump in there. Yeah, can, I, can, you, can I jump in? Go ahead. Because one of the things I wanted is, is the reader that, that, that Tony's team, working with Laura, put out. One was in hard copy first. Um, I come from the broader SSI, self-sovereign identity, decentralized identity community. Um, been there forever. And the reader that was created has really impressed the whole community. You know, who's, they won, they're all like, who's Cardano? Because they live in their own little identity world. But it's being used by a ton of people, not just on Cardano. What's really cool is, one, you know, the, you hear about this NFT that Book.io is behind. Tony's got a stack of them right there. So if you want to see the actual NFT itself with custom covers, yeah, this is sitting there ready to rock. Interestingly enough, it's on the Algorand chain because the book's the book. The content is the content. The student really doesn't care where it's anchored to. We shouldn't care where it's anchored to. It's just, are the right people getting, getting, am I getting access to my thing? Are the right people getting paid? And yes, if you want to get down to the guts of it, why Cardano versus Algorand? Great, terrific, have, have fun. In the meantime, Tony's got these, these, VN, these NFTs ready for you. Anything else you want to add? We feel very similarly, and uh, the Summon platform will be extending to support multi-chain uh, as broadly as possible going forward. Yeah. Awesome. Can I just say one more thing? No, oh, please. Um, so if you, if you do scratch it off and you know, see that there's a value in the book, uh, please go on to um, Book.io and mint one, because you'll be helping support scholarships. So I love that people are getting it free tonight and, and love the exposure and have you guys see an NFT and see how it works. But if you find a value in it, please, please, please go mint one and help us support our scholarships. And thank you guys for coming out. Yes. Seriously, thank you. Cool. Any questions at all? Yeah, we'll take some, we'll take some questions. Um, want to thank the panelists, Daryl O'Donnell, uh, CEO of Continuum Loop, Laura Brigioni, CEO of Student Reader, Adrian Drop, our artist uh, coming up with his book, Behind the Board. Untold Stories. Untold Stories from Untold the Board. Untold Stories Behind the Board. So this is the book that, that we've been talking about as the second book, but it's so exciting because this is a living book that he's, that he's dreaming up, which he tells his side of the story, but then using Web3 technology, people that the story's about can come in and add to it and add to the richness. Summon platform, Adam and Riley. So the book, I, 